Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sense Commercial Wash and Fold and Invoicing webinar. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, my name is Sivan. I am Director of Product Operations here at Sense. And on the side, I lead some webinars from time to time. And I would love to start off while we're waiting for everybody to trickle in. Um, I would love to know where you guys are dialing in from, where are you guys tuning in from? Um, we are here in New York, San Francisco, Washington, DC. We have a couple of different representatives from different parts of the country. So we'd love to hear where you guys are coming in from, dropping in the chat. Oh, it's just us in New York and Washington, D.C. and <laughs> San Francisco. Nobody is here from anywhere or nobody's telling us where they're here from. Um, I would love to know. We got something in the Q&A. Oh, chat is disabled. Thank you, Joe. Um, that's interesting. Uh, Katie, my tech uh, expert, might be able to help me here if chat is disabled. Sorry about that, guys. Um, well, in any case, thank you, Joe. I, you are my shining star today, Michelle, same thing. I'm looking forward to the questions that you guys are going to be submitting, um, today, but we have a lot to cover. So I do want to dive in, uh, with our introductions in just a moment while we figure out if we will have chat enabled. So Katie, just keep me posted on that. But in the meantime, as we mentioned, we're here to discuss how to successfully start, manage, and grow your commercial wash and fold services. So here with me, of course, I have three industry experts, and I'm so excited to introduce them to you today. So first and foremost, we have Daniel. Daniel Logan is the owner of Columbia Pike Laundry in Washington, D.C. He is an expert in commercial wash and fold, has a huge commercial business, and also uh, pickup and delivery. Basically, anything in those elements amongst everything else within the laundromat space. Um, he is our go-to on that side. And on the West Coast, we have Ariana uh, Roviello uh, from Laundry. She's a two-store operator in San Francisco. Um, she has an incredible service, commercial wash and fold, uh, retail self-service, and uh, does a lot of pickup and delivery with the gig economy as well. So super excited to get her perspective. And of course, uh, from Sense, we have Gilly Sharon, who's our chief product officer, uh, who literally talks to operators on a daily basis, understands the industry inside and out, and has a lot of insight and perspective to share as it relates to the commercial wash and fold business. But thank you all so much for being here today. Um, what I'm going to ask you is, of course, while we figure out if we have chat enabled, if you have any questions in the audience at any point during the conversation, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We'll answer as many as we can live. Um, and we may at the end have some dedicated time for Q&A, but just to be totally honest, we did a run through yesterday. We got so excited about everything we were going to talk about that I'm really hoping we have time at the end, but just to set expectations, we might not have dedicated time at the end. We'll try to sprinkle them in throughout. But before I finally stop talking, I would just want to say we're really excited to do this today because like commercial wash and fold and invoicing, there is so much opportunity, but not enough conversation about it in this industry. So we're really excited to have a forum to just share insights where you can get actionable takeaways on how you can implement and grow your commercial wash and fold business um, at your store. So without further ado, we'll dive right in. Uh, Daniel, Ariana, Gilly, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, so I'm going to start actually with Ariana. Uh, how did you realize there was an opportunity for commercial wash and fold? Like how did you get started in this space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when I opened my first store in 2017, I primarily was concentrated on the self-serve and then the residential wash and fold because I was just getting my footing. And we actually had 
an inbound request or inquiry um, from an Airbnb management company to do their laundering for all of their different addresses. And so while it wasn't initially on my radar for the first couple of months, I was like, oh, this is really interesting and like a nice um, consistent like revenue stream that we can get. So um, I think we started with that account, like maybe six months after we opened and we're still servicing that account to this day. Um, and they continue to add addresses and we process more and more for them. So that's where I was first like, oh, there's an awesome opportunity here. Um, I wonder what other types of businesses we can service in our, in our neighborhood. So, um, yeah, that was, that was how it started initially. And Daniel, how did you get into the commercial space? Yep. Yep. So, so, uh, pretty, pretty similar to Ari here. Um, you know, you know, we, we were more so focused when we, when we initially bought the laundromat, we were initially focused on, um, the kind of self-service and then, you know, slowly ramping up the, the, uh, residential washing fold. And then one day I got a call from somebody, you know, it was, it was a, uh, like a, I guess it's called an esthetician, like a spa, like skin spa thing. And they were like, hey, yeah, you know, we 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 uh we we have a bunch of towels and sheets and this kind of thing. Do, do, do you guys do that? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, we do, you know, right? So it was like, you, you know, like really that, and, and then of course we got them, we we still have them to this day. And so it was just like a thing to where like had no kind of idea, you know, had hadn't really gotten around to like trying to figure out like you know, businesses that we could service, but kind of came in inbound. It was a call. They asked if we did it. And we were like, of course we do. We we, yeah. we actually, at that time, we didn't even offer pickup and delivery. And so that was one of the things that actually like spurred us getting into pickup and delivery because it was like, you know, now that we're picking up from these guys, this was, we were, I think we were picking up Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on those days, right? It was like, well, I mean, somebody has to drive and go get these, you know, these items from from this particular uh, business. Like, why don't we pick up two or three or four other residential folks as well along along with it? So um, the commercial launched us into pickup and delivery. So <laughs> the opportunity literally presented itself and it was exactly. too good to pass up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's that's pretty beautiful. Um, so you mentioned nail salons, estheticians. What kind of commercial businesses do you both service? And is there anything out of the ordinary? Because when I think about commercial, I think about hotels. I might think about Airbnbs, restaurants, nail salons. Is there anything that like you do um, or any specific businesses that you service that might not come to mind? I don't know. Daniel, what do you think? Ours are pretty like... Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I mean, we do uniforms for like UCSF. So that's something that's not like linens or napkins or et cetera. And so we wash those for them and then we have to hang them and return them back on a specific type of rolling rack. And so that's kind of a little bit different, but um, I don't know, Daniel, you might have a better. Yeah. Uh, one, 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 of the, one of the interesting ones for us is uh, cleaning companies. So like the companies that go out and clean folks' houses or whatever, right? Um, we like the microfiber tiles that they use to clean everyone's houses. You know, we, we, we launder those for them. We actually have, the, we have that stuff coming in every day, basically. Um, and the cool thing about, yeah, cool thing about these, these companies, right? The, the cleaning companies is, is that, you know, I really see laundry as being on the heels of the cleaning company, like clean, right? So like outsourcing chores, right? So like somebody, yeah. the, the, the same person who's going to pay somebody to clean their house is also going to clean pay somebody to do their laundry, right? And, and so you can Google cleaning companies right now and like 500 cleaning companies come up, right? If you Google laundry service, mm, a few come up, maybe, you know, two, three, four at, at most, right? So, you know, getting in there and kind of partnering with these with these cleaning companies to one, do their towels, right? To be that, you know, to be their 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 vendor, right? But also to uh get access to their customers and do a little bit of cross-selling, you know. Um that, that's been, uh, you know, we say uh, you know, interesting. That that's probably the most interesting one that that we have. I that's have the, to say that I love is that. such an incredible insight. Yeah, Gilly, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think that, you know. It seems clear that when I look at the market from kind of a, a more global perspective, that commercial laundry is an obvious one, right? It's very, very recurring. And these are businesses that are paying for labor anyway, 
So if they're paying for labor anyway, then it makes sense to go ahead and shift, you know, shift that spend either from an in-house team that could be spending their time doing things that are better or more important for the business and shift that spend to a professional, you know, to a laundromat that knows how to do it well. Do you have any other insights around, because I, I love that, go to the cleaning companies and be the laundry provider for said cleaning company. That's the great way in. In having conversations with commercial customers, of course, it's going to be a different conversation than we're trying to like the standard marketing we're doing to get a retail customer. But how are those conversations going? And maybe you can share some insights on how you've won some of those deals beyond just the cleaning companies. Um, not uh, so. You, so just, just insights on getting cleaning companies and other kind of commercial types of accounts. Like um, your outbound. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, or, or are you not doing any outbound? Is it all coming to you? Yeah. Yeah, most of it I would say is inbound. I would say probably 85, 95% is inbound. Um, we 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 kind of loosely spun up a whole uh kind of like a, a sales kind of kind of engine to try to like go out and do some outreach or whatever. Um so yeah, so mo I would say still mostly inbound. I do have some maybe ideas on you know, areas to go for, for doing an outbound, maybe if that, if that, if that, that's what you're hoping for. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a better answer than I was expecting, sure, right? Okay. The, the, like the, the fact that you're growing and it's all coming inbound says something to everybody on this, you know, on this webinar saying, Hey, the opportunity sure. is there if you make yourself available. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. So I, I would say on, on that front, then, um, one one of the things that that we've been doing recently, probably over the last six months, is like uh like like the chamber of commerce, like the local chamber of commerce, um, different uh, networking organizations. Like I think BNI is a is a national uh, networking organization. Um, the, the the cool thing is that like a lot of laundromat owners, laundry service owners, right, aren't in these groups. So like if you were to, to 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 join, you would be the only one there, right? So like we we found that, right? There aren't any laundry or dry cleaning or whatever. So like anytime any of these business owners, they're business owners, right? Anytime they think of laundry or dry cleaning, they're gonna think of you because they they saw your face at these meetings, right? So that was that's one that's one of the kind of I guess tips and tricks that that we yeah, used. I love right that now. Yeah. And Ariana, for you, how much of your business for the commercial side is inbound versus outbound? And how are you vetting those inbound inquiries that come your way? Yeah, I mean, similar to Daniel, I would say that most of it is inbound or referral from existing businesses that we service. So um, that's always a pretty high compliment for someone to be like, hey, like we use this service, like they're great, like here, here they are. Um, if we're just getting kind of like a random inbound inquiry, um, we have a form on our website that specifically um, requests that if you're looking for, for business or commercial services to fill out that form, um, it gives us a really good idea of like what their needs are. Um, sometimes, you know, um, maybe, you know, we have a minimum per week that, that we we choose to put in place to make sure that the discount that we're offering um, makes sense for us, right? So they have to have a mini minimum pound per week. Um, and if they put in that form, like it's gonna be less than that or et cetera, then I offer them other alternatives. Um, like, so they can use DoorDash to do pickup and delivery if, if they don't have as much as we need to do it on with our in-house drivers. Um, or obviously they're welcome to do a walk-in drop-off um, if they're like close to one of our locations. Um, but yeah, the, the form is, is really crucial. Um, it also helps you, and I don't know what we might probably will get into this at some point, but like, um, keep track of like where to put said customer, like from, from a pricing perspective. So, you yeah. know, like, okay, like if, if, and I find this is like, it might not work for everybody, but in the form, instead of asking them how many pounds they're going to be doing, a lot of people do not know how many like pounds of towels they have, but they you do know how, bags. how many bags. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I ask for bags um, to, so they can give me a sense. So if it's going to be two bags a week, it's probably not going to make sense for us to do from a commercial standpoint. If it's going to be 10 bags a week, like that's different. Um, so yeah, there and, and I also encourage you guys to put something like that on your website because that also helps from an SEO perspective. If someone's looking for business services, like you'll pop up more frequently. Um, so yeah, that would be my my kind of tip on that. 
And I love what you mentioned about not asking for pounds versus bags, because for us in the industry, we're so used to talking in the format of pounds, but thinking about who your end customer is and what makes sense to them is ultimately only going to serve to benefit you in attracting those customers and bringing them in. So amazing insights there on your, on your form. I also saw your form. It's branded beautifully. It has, it's very, um, it's very concise, but also just you know, ask, gets you all the information that you need at a glance. Um, so when you guys started this commercial side of your business, both Ariana and Daniel, um, what were your in-house operations like to support commercial wash and fold as that side of your business grew? Like, how do you deal with the labor responsible for commercial customers? Um, yeah. and I know Gil, you probably have a lot of insights also in speaking to many operators about this, about how, we think about labor and laundromats in general, but generally speaking, Daniel, Ariana, like, do you train employees differently? Do you have dedicated employees for this? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so anybody that we're onboarding um, into Laundre, we have a very separate day dedicated to how to process commercial um, accounts. Um because, you know, for our residential, we have a very standard way of doing things. And it's like, you know, the shirts and pants, et cetera, like they're going to be pulled in a certain way. You're getting generally the same types of items. But for these commercial accounts, especially these like really big ones, like if we're doing napkins and pressing, like they need to know exactly like how that specific account or restaurant or hotel wants their napkins pressed. Um, and so we have like a log or like a legend uh, in our back room that is like, okay, this uh, commercial, it's napkins they want it folded this way um and so it's very clear if for whatever reason someone forgets generally once they're trained and they kind of get the hang of it um they know how to process everything um we have an account like the one that i mentioned earlier the airbnb management account um it's all linens but we actually house the linens for them so they have cleaners that will come and pick up the addresses based on their need or demand and so we then have to like we have a special protocol for that. So in short, yes, it requires, I think, um, a separate training. Um, we have everybody on our staff learn everything because if we need to switch things around, if someone's covering for somebody else and we typically get that order in on a Tuesday and, you know, we just want everyone to know how to process everything. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how we do it. Yeah. yeah but I can go, go ahead. Gary. Go ahead. So when I just think about, when I think of, like at Sense, we think a lot about the life cycle of an order, right? It gets placed online, a driver picks it up, it lands on the counter, it goes to a rack, it goes into the washing machine, it goes to the washing and processing thing, then it gets ready for pickup. Like, so all the different stages in that life cycle, we want to go ahead and say, great, a commercial order, a residential, a walk-in order, a delivery order, it can all land on the counter and then go through its process and not do too much interruption to how you know how the employees are currently processing that day whether you're single or more than single coverage how are we fitting this commercial laundry into that existing process and so yes hey we need extra training so even though it's not standard we need to go ahead and do it and you know Dila would love for you to kind of give, give give some feedback on how you've managed like hey we want to treat this the same so we can assembly line it Right. But at the same time, we can't always treat it the same because the nature is different for many of these commercial businesses and how you kind of manage that. That's right. We, we, we've actually uh, kind of broken out at, at, at different stages, right? We, we've broken out the commercial, the processing of the commercial stuff to happen like overnight, right? Like, 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 like a, lot of, a lot of our commercial accounts, like once, once you get trained up on folding the sheets and how the towel to be folded and the pressing and all that kind of good stuff, right? You, you know, the, like, you know, fold, folding, you know, 50 sheets and 200 towels is like, you guys can kind of, you know, we're going to push this off to the evening and let you guys come in here at night and just bang all this stuff out, right? Um, versus, you know, like the, on the residential side, it's more so like, hey, let's make sure, you know, make sure that we're not mixing up this this customer with that customer and these socks look like this customer's socks and like all that kind of stuff, right? So we, we've kind of like tried to, push a lot of our commercial volume to the night our like night crew is what we call them and, and allow them to once they get trained up to to do it kind of separate and that'd be kind of like our like overnight workhorse kind of kind of situation 
That sounds the most efficient. I've definitely heard of operators processing overnight, um, generally speaking, to keep their machines also available for self-service during the days and not occupy those machines, especially those bigger load machines that are oftentimes required for these commercial customers and the volume that they're doing. Um, just on the machinery side, I have a niche question for you, Ariana. Um, I know last year, I actually saw you at the clean show. Um, you had just bought a press and mm -hmm. I think it was specifically with one commercial customer in mind, but like, when do you justify buying new machinery for your scale? And in your case, did it help? Is it like worth it with that press? Uh, I would love to hear a little bit about that. That's a great question. Um, yeah. So when we were approached by a restaurant for napkin pressing initially, I got just kind of like, I, we had never done it before. And I just similar to what Daniel said, I was like, yeah, of course we do that. Like, why wouldn't we do that? Um, and so I just kind of found like a, a kind of a lower grade commercial press that I bought online, did a little bit of research. It wasn't too heavy in, of an investment in case for whatever reason, like the partnership didn't work out. But over time, I could see that like the type of press we were using, we weren't processing as fast as we could be, which was like taking time away from other other um, orders or um, other duties. And so when I went to the clean show, part of why I wanted to, to get a press there, or like at least look at them was like, I'm a pretty visual person and looking online, it's kind of hard to see how like everything works. And so that was really cool to see all the different kinds. And so I, I, I found one that I really liked that would work in our space. Um, and it's a it's a rotary press, and so you feed you feed the you know the linens in, and it presses it quite nice. Um, and so, although we didn't have like the demand for it at the time of purchase, like I want to say two months later, we got a request from one of the biggest hotels in San Francisco to press the napkins for their restaurants, and so um, that was really cool and kind of uh, uh, serendipitous in a way. And so, yeah, so that. I, I did it with the, with the hope of course, that like we would get more. And if it required me to do more outbound, outbound reach like that, it would be great. I do know that there are not a lot of laundry services, at least in our area that specialize in like pressing specialty napkins. Um, there are a lot of companies that will provide linens and then they'll wash it for you. But if you wanted like a, you know, an elevated look in your restaurant, et cetera, um, we're, we're one of the few that do it. So it was, um, yeah, do it now that now that I've said yes to pressing. <laughs> it's also an amazing way to set yourself apart, um, from, you know, other laundromats in your area. And like you said, a lot of your business is inbound on the commercial side. So if, you know, restaurants speak to restaurants, speak to restaurants, it's an amazing way for you to continue to get that element of service. Yeah, absolutely. So my question um, for you both is how are you pricing your commercial wash and fold? And I know that Gilly has, you know, some thoughts at least about commercial pricing versus retail pricing. And if there's ever a world where that might actually be higher, but um, I'm curious to hear first from Daniel, how are you pricing commercial? Yep. So um, kind of the first thing I try to do is figure out, uh, you know, kind of a simple formula, right, is, um, you know, understanding like what our costs are and, and, and you know, you know, how how fast we can process, you know, that 200 tiles, you know, right. So like understanding how much we can process, understanding what our what our costs are, our labor, utility, all those things adding on our our mark the margin that we want to get on it and then literally it's like it's like you know starting out I was you know a little bit uh apprehensive sometimes when I'm sending those, those proposals back to people but now it's just like here's a price like this is what we're comfortable with here's a price you can take it or leave it or you know maybe we can negotiate a little bit but like this is the price you know um, so that's, you know, really, uh, really very cost, cost centric, like understanding what, the, what, what our costs are and then tacking on our margin. And, uh, that's how we arrive at our prices. And that's yeah. 
per pound, essentially, then you're charging uh, your customers. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Per, per pound on uh, the bulk of, of, of the things that we do. If we did do like uh, like the pressing and those sorts of things, like we will we'll kind of come back and do that on like a per item basis. So we'll give you, you know, the, the, the laundry per pound price to just launder it, launder and fold it. If you want it pressed, we'll then count them out and do it by by the item. And that actually goes perfectly with the question that I think was targeted to Ariana about, do you still charge by the pound if you're offering pressing? So if you could answer that, um, I know Daniel just said that he does it, you know, might do it per item. And then I would love to hear a little bit more about your pricing model, Ariana. Yeah. Um, yeah. Similar to Daniel, we obviously figure out what our costs are, what we need to be making, et cetera. We have generally three tiers of pricing based on volume. Um, and I really try to stick to that pricing. Um, I, you know, I think that it, you know, do what makes sense for your business. I will say that in the past I have negotiated down further than I felt comfortable with to get an account. And then as time progressed, I kind of regretted it because it was harder to uh, increase that price. And we were doing a lot of work for that account. So I would just say as a, as a tip from the start, be like, this is the price. If it doesn't work for them, you know, that's all good. Um, but I have three tiers. Um, that's the base price. And then I have a bunch of add-ons that are also per pound. So if they wanted to add vinegar, bleach, oxy, pressing, those are all additional, um, you know, modifiers or, you know, add-ons, if you will. So um, that's how we do it. And also I would very much recommend when you send someone pricing, um, like do a one sheet, I wouldn't do it in an email because you can update your one sheet more frequently, say at the bottom, prices are subject to change with notice. So you can say in the new year, as your labor and your price, go, like prices for things go up, you can be like, it's going up five cents, you know, per pound this year because of X, Y, and Z. You don't really need to tell them they, they know if they're in business that costs are going up, but that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, um, and yeah, so that's where, that's what I would do. I love that. And I think that's so important, you know, with, between inflation and labor costs and cost of goods. Um, I think it's so important to make it clear from the get-go, uh, for the sake of your relationship, that that's one simple takeaway that you can do is anytime you get a new commercial customer, add in literally just a line at the bottom that says prices are subject to change with notice. Um, you know, Gilly, yesterday you and I were talking a little bit about this and I'd love to know based on your conversations with operators as well, is there ever a world in which commercial pricing is actually like higher than retail? Cause I think our assumption is that commercial means bulk means, you know, means discounted. Um, is that always the case? Yeah. So <clears throat> I don't think so. I think that it's a really, it's really a question of labor. Right, like the, the core cost of doing the laundry is not necessarily going to shift. Um, but the labor, and if we're going to be pressing napkins and folding them and turning them to a swan and putting them in a box before you get back to the back to the restaurant, you know, that's going to take a lot more time. You need to factor that in before you just assume I'm getting a ton of volume because volume doesn't change how much time it takes to fold a swan. Right. And so we need to go ahead and incorporate that into our pricing. And then I just want to also just say that it's I'm really happy to hear that the standardization of pricing is important because I think when I when I look at this from a very kind of bird's eye view, that's really important, not just from an accounting perspective, but your ability to scale your commercial business is having that one pager that is, hey, if you are in between the five and 10,000 pound tier, we can go ahead and do that. And then from a systems perspective, we want to make sure that not only are we establishing a specific tier for our commercial customers, but again, we're thinking about how that's going to actually work in our store and on the real world. And so how do we make sure that when that bag of laundry that is part of that commercial tier shows up on, on, on the desk, to Ariana's point, we can go ahead and add the add-on. But if we generally give oxygen brightener for free because my per pound price is $2.75 a pound or whatever it is, you might not want to offer a free oxygen brightener add-on to that commercial account, right? And so let's make sure that at the tablet, at the POS system, when that commercial laundry comes through on that specific tier, only the relevant items are there because it's one thing to establish the pricing relationship with the customer. It's another thing to make sure that's profitable throughout. And so how do we tie what we need from a commercial business side of things 
to a processing and operational side of things to make sure those orders go through as well. And that is part of that conversation is, am I setting up my labor enough that I have the extra time to do the special fold so I can charge actually more than I would for retail on a per napkin or per pound basis? And I think that goes back into what Daniel was saying about the processing times and moving that into the overnights, you know, just like understanding when it makes the most sense to do these things. And a lot of that is trial and error, you know, and like, as you grow, understanding what works best for your business. 100%. Um, yeah. Michelle had a really great question as well. Uh, just on the topic of pricing here, um, when you do establish a new commercial customer, are you doing this via a contract or is it just an email? In um, in their case, they took over a very well-run laundromat, but there were no uh, formal contracts actually established. Yeah, we um, we actually don't have actual contracts. Maybe that's a maybe we need to. Um, we we, we <laughs> yeah, right. We 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 uh, you know obviously like we, like you know. I'm I'm just like all of you guys out there, right? Like figuring it out as we go, right? Um, great, great question though. Um, the the way that we sort of think about it is like we want the service to kind of like hold you. What do you, you know, you know what I mean? Like we don't we don't want to like, oh yeah, we, you're locked in for a year, and you have to use us, right? Um, we, we kind of approach it from the other way of like we need to continue to uh perform and and and, and provide a value to you, and that's how we keep you versus like a piece of paper that we both signed, you know? Yeah. You um, win so, you win their service every time they exactly. get their laundry back. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I I, I could see how contracts could be valuable as well, you know. Um, but but yeah, I, I guess another thing that um that I think about is like I definitely, especially with these, you know, other business owners and commercial accounts that we have, like I I just like doing business with people that are like trustworthy i know that like that's not always the case with with with, with everybody as they run as they run their business but you can kind of get a feel for that you know as you as you talk to people um of course we've all been burned by a couple you know uh people that you know aren't aren't as uh trustworthy and such but um you know just kind of try to generally do business with people who are you know good people from what i can tell you know yeah yeah and yeah, are we, also, we also don't have contracts. Um, I mean, similar to, to, to Daniel's thought, it's like, yeah, we, we kind of want to show based on the service. And, and you know what, I think also just like a lot of clear communication. Um, like a couple of weeks ago, we had like a staffing snafu where like two people were out sick and everything was just like, kind of, you know, our delivery schedule got delayed. And it's like, as long as we let those commercial customers know what's going on, generally they're fine. And we can like be like, hey, we're just going to come a little bit later in the day today, et cetera, um, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I think it's always nice. I mean, maybe there is something that we can put, like if you no longer want to use the service anymore, like please give us like an X amount of time heads up, so to speak. But yeah, generally, um, we, we want people to want to work with us. Um, yeah. I hear that. Um, and so with that being said, uh, before we move on from the pricing conversation, um, Matt actually asked, cause I know I'm familiar with the fact that there's a heavy soil or extra soiled, you know, options sometimes as an add on. There's also, you talked about vinegar, you know, for, uh, at least to remove, uh, some of those stains and smells, Matt is asking what kind of chemistry are you using for your extra special dirty commercial laundry? And my addition to that question is, do you charge extra per pound for that extra special dirty laundry? Or do you know what types of um, soil, I guess, are coming to you from any given uh, business? Yeah, we have different protocols based on like the yeah type of business and what we kind of expect the, you know, heavy soil stains to be like, you know, a lot of restaurants, it's like grease on the napkins. And so if we get like a big bunch, we usually like we'll sort through the napkins to be like, okay, these are just like regular dirty. These are like heavily soiled. And then we will charge them extra for like the heavily soiled items. Sometimes we have to like 
pre stain treat them like and we have to like put them in a big bucket with like stain stuff and like let it soak so like there's a process and that means like that we're charging extra for that but I wouldn't feel comfortable charging them for the whole batch if there's only a subset of napkins mm-hmm. for example um so it just depends uh linens that can be a little bit different but I would say generally bleach <laughs> will do the trick um and and you can also ask them and this is what we do too it's like there are some commercial clients that like really like you know want to stay with eco-friendly product only there are some that don't mind like more chemical um driven stuff um uh detergents and stuff and so we ask them at the beginning and then we know like you know what to what to treat um their their orders with beautiful thank you for that Um, so just to move things along, we will be talking about delivery shortly. Um, but you know, one of the things that I want to talk about is especially for operators that are new to the commercial business, like you said, Daniel, you got a call and you were like, yes, we can do it. We are obviously, you know, so enticed by the possibility of machines running of dollar signs and stuff like that. When do you say no to an opportunity in the commercial space? Like, I think that this is something that we need to talk about because again, you guys have done a lot of trial and error, but when do you say no to a commercial customer? Yeah. Um, we we actually had to say no, like within the last week to a, to a customer. Um, we, it, it was a, it was a hospital hospital facility, um, and well, it was actually kind of two things, two reasons why we why we ended up saying no. One was because um, the the volume that was going to come in was going to be just like you know so much crazy volume. Like I think they were talking about like a thousand pounds every couple of days, right? And so um, you know un- understanding that type of volume coming in, like like we aren't the best suited to be able to do that, right? You want like the tunnel washers, you know, from, from the hotels that are coming in with the thousand rooms or whatever, right? Um, that's different from like what we're kind of set up to do. We, as in laundromat owners in general, right? Um, you know, you know, we, we have lots of small machines. Those guys have like very few huge machines, right? Yeah. And so they can they can do, you know, a thousand room hotel and 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 you know four hours or what what you call it, right? Um, so like we're just like not really set up for that that amount of volume. It was just too much volume. And then two, um this was a this was also a like a nursing home type of deal. And so like you, we talked about heavy soils, right? So like bodily fluids and those sorts of things, right? You know, I, I went to the team and was like, hey, like, I mean, how do you guys feel about that? And they were like, no, right? And so like- <laughs> That's <laughs> you, a no for me, dog. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? So so like, so like also taking like, you know, taking your, your team into account and like, yeah, like, like, you know, they're the ones that are doing it, right? Like, I'm not, I'm yeah. not the one that's in there rolling my sleeves up doing it. I mean, I will if, if, if I have to, and I have in the past, but you know, these are the people that are doing it, you know, day in, day out. So like taking them into account in, in, and in, in what you, what you're bringing in, you know, um, yeah. that's definitely a big one. Love that. And get, and sorry, Ariana, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue to push this forward. Um, uh, but to sum that up, it's just really important to know what you can and what you can't do. Like when you are a commercial wash and fold business, you are not an industrial wash and fold business. And, you know, understanding that differentiation is only going to serve to benefit you and help you get the customers that will help you grow your business and not actually inundate you and drown you with one single customer, um, as enticing as that might actually be. But, you know, speaking of these commercial accounts, you know, you mentioned nail salons. I've been to nail salons where they might have a washer dryer or, you know, hotels. I assume there are washer dryers in there. Gilly, can you speak a little bit about the competitive advantages of outsourcing wash and fold for these types of businesses? Because I imagine these are things that, if you are doing outbound outreach to these types of commercial businesses, you need to understand what you're combating, right? You need to know what their objections might be. Like, why would it be beneficial for them to outsource wash and fold for a hotel, for example? Yeah. I think that when you're thinking about, you know, to to Dila's point, the industrial side 
wide, that's that's going to be the whole other world. And that world is already expecting to outsource that wash and fold. I think there's a really big opportunity, obviously on the retail side, but also on the commercial side to say, hey, move from in-house to, to, to sending it out. And I think that's where a lot of the opportunities really kind of are presenting themselves. And we look at this at a high level, the types of businesses running through our platform that are being sold wash and fold laundry are these smaller businesses that just fit, right? We can do it. Now, that's not to say don't buy a press. That's not to say don't buy a big washing machine, right? Like no one's saying don't upgrade your thing, but you're, you don't have a warehouse to put a towel washer in, in your existing store. That's fine, but see what you can fit. You know, to Ariane's point, she wanted to go to the clean show to see what the press looked like so she should visualize it in her store. Again, I'm always going back to that process to know how it can actually work profitably. And just my hats off to, to Daniel for saying, yes, Part of that profitability is how your labor, how your employees are in, in doing this work and absolutely take that into take that into account. And so when you look at the old machines, right, when you look at the volumes going up at like at a, at a, at a small boutique hotel or at a nail salon, the efficiencies are just not there. The efficiencies aren't there in a number of ways, right? If you're doing laundry all day, every day in a really inefficient machine, nobody knows better than the people on this call about, you know, water usage, heat, you know, <clears throat> how efficient we are on transferring that heat, right? And how newer machines get much better efficiency. And so when you look at a lot of these mom and pop businesses, you know, a lot of them have like a little bit older machines and they're running them all day. Maybe they're, maybe they're growing, maybe their volume is going up. And so now we're having a different conversation. It's not just about labor. It's about how much time am I spending here and how efficient am I at doing that at doing that laundry, right? Because, you know, if you're doing overnight commercial laundry in a laundromat, you can put it in 18 different machines. You don't have space for that, you know, in, in, your, in your small boutique hotel or your nail salon. We should probably use that space for something better. And so the conversation that we're seeing happen across these different commercial businesses is like, hey, I can actually save money or, or make my business more efficient by taking this piece of it, which is an important all day piece of it off my shoulder and give it to a professional to handle it, they can handle it better and faster and more efficiently. Now, that being said, I imagine that as volume increases and we're going from maybe 200 pounds, 300 pounds to what, a thousand pounds a week for individual businesses, there might come a time where they're questioning the cost of this and bringing it in house. How do you, Ariana and Daniel, um, how do you mitigate that as a business owner, the potential for these commercial accounts to bring it in house? Uh, I mean, we haven't come across that like ourselves yet. I mean, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. So like if they want to like hire the people to, to manage and make sure everything's on track, like by, by all means, but it's, it's a lot of work and also like a lot of upfront investment in equipment and, um, you know, presses, machines, washer, like the whole thing. And so I would say it's safe, at least in my opinion, safe to say that it's probably better to just outsource it. Like we, we know what we're doing. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. And I don't know, Daniel, if you've come across anything like that. Yeah. 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 I, I would say that, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the small businesses that we get, like they were kind of like running to us because they were doing the laundry themselves for, for so long or whatever. Right. And they're like, oh, like, you know, they might have seen one of our vans driving around. And they're like, oh, I didn't even know this existed. So it's like they, they were like running to us to like offload that stuff. And like when, when we go to 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 make the pickups and the, the deliveries, the staff are like, hey, and they're like super nice because like they don't have to do it anymore. Please take this. <laughs> right. You you know what I mean? So it's, so it's kind of like on, on that side to where like, you, you know, a, a, like the, 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 the types of businesses that are like the perfect fit for us to do, right? Like, like, like it's so much of value for them because they don't have to do it and that they don't have to worry about it. That's kind of one yeah. of the things that we sell is like, you, you know, it's, it's like, you know, a load off, you, you're taking a load off, right? Um, you know, by, by, by allowing us to do it. So that's kind of like one of our, one of our selling points. Yeah. The consistency yeah, and the quality that quickly, you Sivan. Yeah. Yeah. So Sorry. I also think that I'm just, gonna, I'm just I'm just gonna say that I think in the same way that we talk about this now in our industry around retail, where brand now matters, service now matters, we're moving away from this commodity economy that maybe still exists for the industrial, where it's just like I need the cheapest possible price for this one white sheet, 
right? I think that one of the ways that we mitigate against people bringing that in-house is the expertise that these business owners bring to the table when doing laundry, right? Mm -hmm. it's, It's on their website, it's in their brand name. And so how do we go ahead and share that, not just the retail customer trying to get them to send out their laundry, but to the commercial customers that won't go away from us because they are reliant, not just on the price, but on the expertise that we bring to the table. And the communication and the, you know, you know, like, you know, hey, hey, are you closed on, you know, I guess whatever holidays we got, come, are you guys closed? What are you this? What are you that? We know you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, I do want to do a quick time check. We are at like 15 minutes left in this session and so much more to cover. So I want to dive straight into delivery and delivery management with pickup and delivery. So Daniel, I know that you've mentioned, you know, early on that your first commercial customer basically led to the start of your pickup and delivery business. Mm -hmm. Um, but how are you, I'll, I'll start with you, Daniel, as I'm speaking to you, how are you managing pickup and delivery for these commercial customers? Are they a part of your retail routes? Are they commercial specifically? Do you outsource it? Is it in-house? Um, what's that like high level overview? Yep. Yep. So all of our commercial stuff, we, we handle with our in-house drivers. Um, so we have four vans, and five or six drivers that kind of rotate or whatever, we do handle it as part of our um, retail routes. So, you know, you know, as as um, as our drivers are out picking up residentials as part of their route that's on their on their driver app, they're seeing a mix of residential and commercial. And they just when they're in that area, as it optimizes and routes them to to those those spots, that, that's how it happens. Um and for the, for the most part, a lot of our commercial accounts don't really require a lot of like, oh, hey, do this and do that and knock on this door and go around the back and do, you know, like, you, you know, so so we're still able to still service them like that, right? Where it's like, yeah. hey, the bag's right here. You know, we, we walk in the, in, in the front door of the shop. Here's the bag. Grab it and go. Um, so, you know, it works for us to, to be able to do it on a, as part of our residential route, which is, you know, kind of more economical that way, um, since we aren't having to do a whole, you know, jump through a bunch of hoops in order to, you know, get the laundry once we get to the actual location. And I know that, you know, Ariana, you're maybe a little bit newer to the in-house driver situation. Um, what is your in-house delivery experience for uh, your commercial customers? Yeah, um, so we yeah we don't include residential um, for our in-house pickup and delivery. We use DoorDash exclusively for that, which is nice for us because it it leaves a lot of room for us to be able to have our in-house people solely focus on commercial. And so we do a route Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, both pickup and delivery for those commercials. Um, And unlike lucky Daniel, we have a lot of um, commercial accounts who we like need a special pass to go downstairs, like pick up the laundry and like do all this stuff. So we definitely need our in-house team to not only do it, but know the people that they're picking up from. Um, We don't have as robust of um, a route, you know, as, as Daniel, we have one one van, um, those three days. Um, and we always tell our commercial, I'm like, if it's a Tuesday and like, you need some stuff done quickly, just let us know, like, we'll come get it. Um, but we just try to keep things on a schedule, obviously, to make sure that we're um, being as efficient as possible. Awesome. And I think that speaks to so much how you are able to manage both gig economy and your own drivers and on, on sense specifically, obviously. Um, but you know, we were specifically asked about outsourcing to gig economy for commercial Gilly for you and your experience in speaking with operators. Have you spoken with operators who use the economy for commercial and, you know, how is that relationship different for commercial and retail customers? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that we, we heard it, it is, it is different, right? A com- like, and, 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 you know, to Daniel's point, He's choosing customers or, or commercial customers that he can fit on that route, right? It's not just a consideration of can it happen in the store? Do I have the machines? Do I have the labor, right? It's also a consideration of is it going to work with the rest of my system so I can grow my business without throwing wrenches into the existing process in my business? Now, if Daniel had an opportunity to go to like eight different places on a separate route for just commercial customers, 
Sure, I'm sure that we would, you know, you know that he could consider that, and we could figure out how to make that make that profitable. But way better if I could just add another stop on the route. In Ariana's case, a little more complicated with it with a, with a DoorDash driver, with a gig economy worker. And I think the answer, and it always goes down to the question between my own drivers or DoorDash or some combination of, of, of both, is who's the customer and what's their need. In many times, if you're doing a daily pickup from the nail salon, a gig economy driver can work just fine. It's a nail salon. I walk in. Hi, I'm here to pick up the order. Here's one bag of clothes. Now, if I'm going to a, 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 a hotel once a week and I've got 17 bags of clothes, then, of course, the gig economy is not going to work. But it's not mutually exclusive, right? You don't have to make a decision. For the nail salon, you can call, you can call the person and be like, hey, I'm going to set you up every Monday at 930 in the morning. Cool? Send DoorDash. Hey, I'll be at your hotel once a week at 3.30 in the afternoon, 3.30 to 5 p.m. with my own drivers on a route. Cool? No problem. You mm. can do both, mm. right? And so I'm obviously speaking specifically about Sense, right? But one of the whole core notions of, of the Sense products is that flexibility to meet your customers and your team where they need to be, to, where they need to be in order to get the job done. I love that. I love that. And I actually think it's a really great segue into my next topic. And Michelle, I'm so glad that you asked this question, but Gilly, you know, just to continue that conversation about the flexibility of technology and, you know, not having it be mutually exclusive, what are the different ways that technology has helped establish commercial laundromat businesses, you know, like, and why, why is that important? Why is laundry specific invoicing important? Why is laundry specific commercial management important? Yeah. So technology is going to be the ability for you to do what you've done once and scale that and add new without adding process, right? Things around like commercial tiers. You set it up once, you have a tier or multiple tiers based on volume or difficulty or whatever it is. And then you can start feeding additional customers new opportunities into those existing frameworks that you've built process around. And so without technology, you can't create a strong, repeatable baseline that you can then continue to add elements into it, whether that's customers or, or, or whatever it is. And so invoicing, right? Also the same, the same idea here, right? Now, I want to just say, and, I, and I, love, I love our invoicing product, and I think it's great. If your customers are willing to pay you today, take the money, right? I'm not here to tell you that commercial customers need to be invoiced. Commercial customers need special pricing. They need special care. Sure, but from a money conversation, yes, we can go ahead and, 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 and of course create the invoice, but if they're willing to pay us on a per order basis, take your money now. Now, that said, an invoice, compared to kind of the standard invoice you'd see on a QuickBooks Online where you're just adding line items or items to an invoice, right? The line items of an, of an invoice for commercial laundry are the orders themselves, and those orders have line items inside of them. Right. Not to get overly technical here, but there is a unique need when you're invoicing for multiple orders that had a start and a finish that all are now completed. How can we aggregate those onto a vehicle that we call an invoice and take a payment for that in aggregate and have that payment then actually auto apply backdated to the specific invoices that there the is orders on that invoice that it's paying for. And so technology unlocks your ability to not do it once but to do it again and again and again. I think that's so important. And, you know, we hear about zombie mats. We hear about, you know, the inability or the, not the inability, but the uh, rejection of technology sometimes. But if you are serious about scaling and wanting to grow into the commercial side of things, having technology to do that is going to be so critical to support that scale. So Michelle, to answer your question, we um, are widely launching invoicing, I think within the next week or two. Uh, it's been in beta uh, for a handful of our customers and uh, super excited. It is so beautiful. Uh, our Just like Gilly described, all the orders within a given period, whatever you select are aggregated onto an invoice. Your customers have the ability to pay online um, or you can of course record an offline payment, but it looks beautiful and is just if I may chef's kiss that. Um, but speaking of payments, uh, Ariana and Daniel, how are you collecting payments for your invoices right now? Um, Ariana, like what are those payment methods that, uh, your, uh, uh, that your customers are requesting? 
Yeah, I mean, we do um, kind of a variety of things if they're actually not even if they're small, but we have a couple accounts that prefer to do like card on file, pay as, pay as the orders come in. Um, we have a couple that want to do like an ACH transfer. Um, we don't accept checks. I don't have time to deposit checks. I don't want checks. <laughs> Um, and so I, we don't do that, but if you want to pay via, you know, the invoicing link, if you want to do a direct ACH, that's fine. And then if you want to pay with your card on file, that's fine. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited, excited about the invoicing feature, um, and how it aggregates all the orders together and just sends them out, saves a lot of time at the end of the month. That's awesome. Yeah. We, 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 we accept, um, all those same types of payments, you know, card on file, um, ACH, uh, we do take checks <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, uh, it's like no getting around it. Like, like a, a very few people like that, we, that we allow to do the checks. I got like three checks floating around that I need to deposit or whatever at, as we speak. Um, man, I'll tell you like one thing about like, uh, you know, we're out right outside of DC. We're in Arlington. Um, and man, dealing, dealing with the government and they're like invoicing. Ah, uh, oh my goodness. I got, I got, uh, we, we don't have time for, for that, but like <laughs> such a painful process. Oh my goodness. <laughs> There's a support group for that. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I need to find it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the long, I was actually going to say that I'm sure if you're working with government agency, homeless shelters, um, anything like that, uh, it would require a, uh, a check to be submitted for sure. Um, I don't think that they have an Amex card on file. Um, but yeah, Gilly, why don't, while we go into the last kind of portion, which, and I would love more questions. If you guys have any questions, we have five minutes, but I, um, but Gilly, if you want to show us what that looks like, uh, just on sense, um, uh, the payment page, at least, uh, just so you could see what your client would experience. So I'd love for you to share your screen and show that. Um, and, oh, oh see, do you understand why chefs, why chef kissed earlier? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you'll be able to see here just the card or US bank account number. Um, and of course it wouldn't say sense. It would actually have your logo, um, that's uploaded to the system. This is just a demo account here. Um, and the customer would be able to enter in all their details here. And if they are paying by check, it's integrated with, um, they would have to log into their bank account and then it would initiate that transfer. So super cool. Right. Super so traditionally, yeah, traditionally ahead. online pay, pay, payments, um, and invoicing and getting paid online for an invoice expedites the, the time of payment. But I don't remember the exact number, but it's some astronomical number of time to money in your bank account. Sometimes it's the time to actually get the check. Other times it's because Daniel's just been sitting on the check for two weeks and never deposited it, right? But those are all experiences that we can relate to. And so allowing for a comfortable, simple, straightforward online payment experience can really expedite money to your bank account. And so, you know, naturally here, we keep, we keep it really simple where we just like, hey, this is, this is the price. In a laundry order, especially for commercial customers that have consistent orders over and over again, the price isn't always some crazy variable. And so we don't need at face value to necessarily see too much detail. The idea here is simple, get paid. Of course, we give options if they need to see more information, they can dive in and understand exactly what's on every single order on that invoice, absolutely. But at face value, we want the customer's experience to be simple, straightforward, and payment focused. Love that. And you'll see, as you described earlier, the aggregate on the right-hand side, it had the different wash and fold orders. And when you click into it, it has the order breakdown. So super, super cool. But um, in these last two minutes, I can't believe it. I told you guys this time would fly by. Um, I would love to know words of wisdom. I know that we have some operators here who are new to commercial. Um, Ariana, what's something that you wish you knew when you started wash and fold? I know you already gave us the beautiful tidbit of, you know, prices are subject to change without notice, et cetera, but what do you wish you knew? And yeah. Daniel, I'm going to ask you the same question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I kind of touched on it earlier, but ultimately kind of not being afraid to say no to an account or not like negotiate on your pricing. Um, I, I, I did that like a few too many times. Um, and it just wasn't worth the time and energy to, to, to do those, to do those, um, accounts. And so staying firm, I think it's kind of a, 
it's kind of a well-known thing in the industry that like you negotiate based on like type of business. I think if you put it into like, you know, a few buckets of pricing based on volume, that gives you a very clear baseline. If someone, you know, really wants to knock five cents off or whatever, and it makes sense for you, fine. But I would just stay, say stick, stick to your guns. Um, and, you know, the pricing is this, if it doesn't work out for them, then, you know, that's okay. In other words, know your worth, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> know your worth. Yeah. Um, I love that. Uh, Daniel, how about yeah. you? I would say uh, really understand who you are and who you aren't. Um, you know, as we were talking about, like the big, you know, the the big huge ho- thousand room hotel that wants to wants you to do their laundry, like, uh, you know, you'll 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 see the dollar signs first in your head, like, oh boy, Hilton Hotel, oh boy, that's 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 a lot of volume, and you, and you and you get your calculator and you add it up, like, oh, that's you know X amount per week, oh boy, you know, but but like understand that like you aren't re- I'll speak for myself but you know we, we may not be as as positioned to be able to do that as one might think right so understand that that you know th- those guys need the the big industrial with the with the with the tunnel washer versus what we're set up to do is more so on like a more individualized level right so like so like think like you know big box versus boutique right we're not a big box you know, to, to an extent, right? We're more like boutique where we can press your napkins and do this, that, and the third, right? So um, so really, really, really understanding where you are and where you fit um, is, is is definitely helpful and will help, help you. I love that so much. Um, Gilly, did you have anything to add? Sure. So, I mean, I think that's great. From my perspective, there is just a world of opportunity out there for the for, for laundromats and, and, and local operators in different cities to go capture this volume. I think it's really hard to do that without the right technology in place to manage all the complexity of the different revenue streams. But, you know, moving forward, if commercial laundry doesn't represent a good chunk of your revenues, then I think that there's probably an opportunity you can go grab, do it smart, don't overdo it. Don't say yes when you shouldn't say yes. All of those things are true. But mm-hmm. what we're seeing is that the opportunity is there. I assume all the people on this call are joining because they see that opportunity also. And just make sure you think about all the little nuance that we talked about in this conversation about how to take in that new volume, but go get it. Absolutely. And I hope that at least today you've walked away with some actionable takeaways on how you can, you know, create a client intake form for you to be able to manage these inbound um, types of organizations that you can partner with or companies that you can partner with for any outbound outreach, understanding labor and when to invest in new machines. And more so than anything, just remembering who you are, your identity and the service that you provide to these commercial customers that will make it a no brainer for them to come back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining today. I appreciate the time, Ariana, Dan, Daniel, Gilly, thank you so much for joining. I had so much fun. I can't wait to do this again soon. Yes, and I, I, yeah, thank I'll you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll take care. Talk soon. Okay. All Bye. Right, yeah.